Welcome everyone to our Wizards of Live session on the Oxlate Clean 15 plus 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 plus. Hopefully we're going to give you a way of thinking about your um, standard shopping list, let's say, in a different way. And I just want to let everyone know that Susan Owens won't be with us today, but she sends her love and is uh, busy with other things. So your other three wizards will be handling today's meeting, and that will include myself in Toronto, Patricia de la Garza, who is in Belgium, and Carla Weersma, who is in Colorado in the US. And I'm Monique Attinger, and uh, we're here to give you some ideas about food. But I'll just begin by saying as well, this is educational information for you. Please do not consider it medical advice. Uh, when having any questions about your own personal health, please speak to your trusted medical care person, whether that's your doctor or your nurse practitioner or whoever it is that you're working with. And we will get started on how to bias your diet for lower oxalate without having to count, by the way. These are all quote unquote safe lower oxalate foods. That's right. So we're going to be, uh, we already had a session on the dirty dozen with some honorable, honorable mentions. And those were the very, very high or the very common high oxalate foods where people get in trouble. So it's not necessarily the highest in the list that we've measured, but they're the ones that are usually giving trouble. But after giving that as a warning of the toxicity of oxalate, I think we really wanted to make a list of things that you could eat, things that you can eat and you can eat without worry. So we're actually uh, playing again on this concept of the Environmental Working Group Clean 15, but with our own criteria. You want me to go on? Okay. So sure. uh, what we're <laughs> going to do is that the idea is that this is a new shopping list. These are some staples, some things that are highly nutritious, these are things that are low in oxalate, and these are things that any omnivore would eat or could eat. So this is not the list of things that you're going to exclusively eat if you're actively lowering your oxalate intake. So remember that these would be like your basic foods where you would be adding some higher oxalate foods to make sure that your level is dropping in a very gradual and mindful and slow as you need it because of your particular health conditions. All of the things that we're saying is general information. We don't know you. We don't know your specifics. We don't know your genetics or anything like that. So all of this is general information. But this will give you a very, very good idea to uh, give you uh, some really robust nutrition without having to worry about the oxalate content. So yeah. we're not being we're not going to be worried about your food preferences or your allergies or your sensitivities. And even between the three of us, we had a little hearty discussion about what should be in this list. But we'll, we'll um, be commenting on why we did it and why our choices are the ones we did. Yeah, good, good overview. And now I'm going to hammer away on a point which I think I've made before, which is pattern over precision. So one of the things we we're trying to help you with here is the whole idea of pattern over precision, because you cannot do this diet perfectly. We simply have too much variation in how things might be grown and varieties and all kinds of things, which will impact how much oxalates in the particular food that you have in front of you. However, that doesn't mean we can't bias in the direction of lower oxalate foods and away from higher oxalate foods. It just means that 
if you love having um, decimal places in your data on how much oxalate's in something, you might be a little disappointed by uh, the fact that we can't really do that. However, we can present you with a clean 15 based on food groups and individual foods from the triangle oxalate spreadsheet that you can use as a basic shopping list. Let's face it, we all tend to have a set of basics that we're buying virtually every week. These would be the kinds of things we think you can include there. And in a way where you can cover your spectrum of food choices or requirements. So there may be some things in here which are not, let's say nutrient dense, but are easy for you to get and will work as part of your diet, we've included those kinds of things as well. So. Do you wanna get it, Carla? Well, the first one is is really animal-based products and, you know, steak, chicken, pork, fish, and particularly organ meats. They are very, nutrient dense seafood is very nutrient dense and if you're an omnivore you can pretty much have all of these and with the exception of of maybe flavored yogurts it, it's all very low to no oxalate and one of the big concerns is, you know, when you're dropping oxalate, you know, I'm dropping these high oxalate foods, but they're also high nutrient. Well, you can get a lot of the nutrients that you need from organ meats. You know, they're, they're rich in, you know, vitamin A, you know, iron, vitamin E, the B vitamins. You can get you know, pretty much what you need, you know, from seafood. And it's free from an oxalate standpoint. Exactly. And yep. So all animals and also all animal products, meaning dairy and eggs and things like that, that not, not necessarily an animal, but are the products of an animal. So, uh, you know, like I was going to say, and the name just skipped my mind. The little fish eggs, caviar, that's what I was looking for. You know, caviar is also, you know, a product of an animal. So you could have a lot of those and not have to worry about your um, oxalate intake. The only exception I would put in here is if you start to do things like bone broth, and things like that, where you're going to be boiling it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, that might give uh, your body a too high of an intake, something called glycine. That could eventually, if you don't have your B6 levels up to level and some other nutrients up to par, you might get into oxalate trouble. So, but in general, Meats and, and animal products are a good to go if you want to go lower. And, and, and if, if, oh, if go there ahead. is a concern about, let's say, kidney disease or gout, where they recommend low protein, talk to your doctor and and make sure that they're okay with that. Yeah. You know, when in doubt, that's what your your physician is there for. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I'll add that one of the things that's possible with some of our nutrient dense animal products is that you can get a lot of something. So things like liver, where I've referred to nature's multivitamin, um, please be aware that you can get a lot of really good bioavailable nutrients here. And in some cases, I've even worked with clients where we did not have them on other supplements uh, because they were having some problems with the supply chain over the last few years. And I had clients in locations where they couldn't get things. 
And I actually had a rotation for them of organ meats to consume instead. So we are talking about very nutrient dense. And also perhaps we want to keep in mind what we're getting from those kinds of products if we're thinking about supplements as well. So as with everything, go slowly. And in this case, maybe even with organ meats, go a bit slowly. Sorry. Uh, it's not letting me change. Hold on. Give me a second. Um, so we were here. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. So the second category is fats and oils. And those are things that you could also um, go at it rather liberally. So uh, butter is an excellent, excellent choice. It's an obvious animal-based saturated fat. Those people that have issue, issues with casein, which is a protein in the milk. See, this is a different thing from lactose, which is a sugar in the milk. So if you have problems with casein, he might be a good alternative because actually in the butter fat, in the butter oil, all of the casein is um, fried or burnt and it goes to the bottom of the pan. So if you filter it, then you have a product that is casein free, very naturally. And uh, it's delicious, it's highly nutritious, and uh, and a very, very good fat overall. If I've never seen goat or sheep butter, but if you can find them, you know, go. For I it. have found goat butter. I, um, I think the notorious Whole Foods, which we sometimes call whole paycheck in our family here. <laughs> you might be able to find butters, which are based on other animal milks. And the main reason to mention this here is that for some people who are very sensitive to the type of casein, but are okay if you get to this um, a two casein and away from A1 casein. A1 is just the designation given to the kinds of casein that's in uh, conventional dairy with your, you know, Holstein cattle and those kinds of common milk cattle. Um, but A2 casein is found exclusively in goat and sheep. And you can actually get A2 casein certified cow's milk products and those are usually yeah. older breeds of cattle uh where they can they can verify that the animal has a double their their homozygous for the production of a2 casein over a1 casein so it's another option for those who may currently think that they can't handle something like a butter or a ghee um although ghee of course once you take the casein out and you're just using essentially a butter oil, that's different. But if you want to use butter, um, I have used goat and I have used sheep and uh, goat's got that stronger taste to it. But sheep is very mild, like like cow's uh, milk products. And Ian was one who, who could not handle any cow dairy, but did absolutely fine on goat and, and sheep dairy products. He had no issues with it at all. And now he's he's fine with all dairy, but you know, initially, yeah, nothing with nothing with the traditional yeah. dairy that we usually get. He couldn't handle any of it. And that is an, a great comment because that was the case for us as well. Because we were very, very sensitive at the beginning. And uh as your gut heals and as your oxalate load diminishes then all of a sudden new options are open to you. So now we have zero issues with butter or with heat. So yeah, I, I should say we had the same thing here. As we lowered our oxalate, dairy products was one of the first things we were able to put back in our diet mm -hmm. after avoiding them. So it's a very good point that over time we may get some capacity to handle a product back because we've gotten this confounding factor called oxalate out of the way. Yeah, and our gut is in a better place. 
Olive oil is the same. It's another very good. It's obviously not animal based, but it's uh, but it's had has a lot of nutrition, has a lot of polyphenols, and uh, it should be in a dark glass and should be ideally more towards the greenish side than the yellowish side but that's you know it depends really on the variety and whatever of the olives first pre first uh pression so that it's the first time that they um press the olives and really know your company because here in the u.s in uh, in europe they made a study of different famous brands of olive oil and uh to confirm, you know, if they hadn't been tampered with, and a great majority of the cheap ones were not 100% olive oil. So know your company, and that's a good place to invest in a very good, high quality, high price, higher price olive oil. And the dark um, glass is to help it from becoming rancid. And the other thing, if uh, you have if you remember to take it out of the fridge, it's sometimes a good idea. Then it becomes solid. That should be another little inkling to see if you are getting the real thing. So if it gets harder in the fridge, then you know you have the real thing. If it stays completely liquid, start checking it out. Oh, so who wants to take this one? <laughs> I can. You can do it. So we were looking at flowers that had a high degree of nutrition and you could use liberally because there's a lot of flowers and Carla has been generous with all of our group, especially in the recipes group when she sees that she's using a lot of mixes. So you can have a chickpea flour with another flour, with a starch, with something like that. But in those mixes, which are gluten-free and low oxalate, lower oxalate and whatever, sometimes you have to uh, be very careful on the amount of servings that you would be getting. So it would be, it would be okay if you eat one or two cookies, but it might not be okay if you're going to, you know, down, you know, two dozen of them. So um, the flowers that we put in this Clean 15 were really the flowers that you could use more liberally without having to worry about how much you're getting in. So uh, coconut flour is great. It's very high nutrient. It's a little different to bake or to use than other flours because it, uh, it tends to absorb a lot of the moisture. So you will need to provide extra liquid if you want to do any type of cooking or baking with uh, coconut flour. But it's, um, it's a fabulous, it's delicious, you know, and it's... Uh, and it works really well. We make here a fabulous birthday cake with uh, old coconut, you know, and eggs. And um, the flax seeds as a meal is, you know, as a flower, it, they're just absolutely wonderful. Whoops, I didn't do that. And uh, we can make it, we can make it as a milk. We can make them, we can uh, use them as a binder. And you can add them just like that, you know, to add a little crunch and a little more texture to some of your dishes. And they could be used in a more liberal fashion. I often use the meal in conjunction with the coconut flour and it helps to reduce the amount of eggs that, that you need. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, that's a really good point, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I'd say here is that you're getting so much more for every bite when you're using either flax meal or whole flax seeds or coconut flour as part of your baking. Because when you make a muffin, as we do here periodically, 
and you're using something like a rice flour, which may work fine or other kinds of starchier flours, you're not getting the same level of nutrients that you get with these. But truly, probably the biggest reason to go in this direction is that you can use these and not worry about how much oxalates in your end product. They are they are really very straightforward here and very simple so that you don't have to be necessarily tracking everything that you're making in a lot of detail in order to understand that you've got a low oxalate end result. That's right. Oh yeah, fruit. Yes. And so, when you think about fruit, while there are low oxalate fruits from different parts of the spreadsheet, you can absolutely eat uh, more than this particular group. The melons are actually a really great choice. And the reason for that is there's not one of these where you're looking at something that is higher oxalate. All of these are low in the traditional half cup serving. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Sorry. And, and so if you like to include fruit in your diet, cantaloupe, what we would call a honeydew melon, a green melon, a watermelon, all of these are great choices. And note that those seeds are uh, likely edible regardless of which melon you're dealing with, but we have certainly tested watermelon seeds and those are low. Um, now, having said that, this is also part of the gourd family and bitter gourd is not the same as these typical sweet melons, which are low. It is actually a high oxalate melon. So while we're advocating for these as, you know, your more exactly. conventional sweet fruit, uh, bitter gourd is a whole different thing. So the sweet melons, great. We'll talk more about the squashes later, um, but these are a pretty safe option if you're just going into your local supermarket to buy fruit. And watermelon is actually the lowest out of, of the group. So you can, you can really chow down on those. Cantaloupe tends to be at a little higher at the low end, but still very doable. And honeydew is between the two. Yeah, absolutely. And if you need uh, something that we use in Mexico a lot is uh, flavored waters and we flavor them with fruit. And melons are some of the really big players. So if you need to increase your water intake or you need to increase your kids' water intake, you know, mixing some watermelon with a lot of water and maybe tiny, you know, a few drops of lemon juice, you will get a delicious drink that will make him drink up. And uh, drinking is extremely important when you're lowering your oxalate. Yeah. Yeah. Grains are probably, they're my favorite. Well, well they were. Bonio is, is probably one of the best nutrient-dense low oxalate grains that, that you can get. Unfortunately, it's not very easy to find. You know, Amazon has it, but depending on where, you know, where you're at, you may not be able to, you know, to get it locally or like I can find it at Whole Foods or a Sprouts Farmer's Market here, but, you know, if you're across the pond, that may be, you know, a, a different, you know, a, a different story, but it's a very good grain. The other one that we mentioned is white rice. No, it is not nutrient dense, but it is very low oxalate. And if for some reason you need the carbs, you know, my son was one that needed to be on a higher carbohydrate diet for medical reasons. White rice was a staple because we could, he could have copious amounts and oxalate was not an issue. 
So yeah. it you know, it's something to to keep in your you know in your shopping list. Absolutely, and rice is also a very good vehicle for other foods. So you could mix it with something and make, you know, a uh, fried rice type of thing with all sorts of different greens or things that you might want to try. You know, it's just a good mixer, even if it's not the basis of your nutrition. It's, uh, it's a good way to get full belly with uh, lovely um, low oxalate veggies and, uh, and have it as, you know, like a vehicle for good nutrition. The phonio in on the other side of the pond is an African uh, cereal. And so if you look for African uh, stores where they sell, you know, their food wares, you can find it easily. I found in, uh, in Europe, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it in a lot of specialized places. But the price difference is incredibly high between an African food market and a specialty, you know, new age type of uh, health food store. Just to give you an idea, I found 130 grams of Fonio for 35 euros in one of those fancy stores. And I just bought two kilos for over 20, 20 euros. So um, check check your prices and check where it is. And the one that I bought was also organic. So this is growing next to the Sahara Desert. So I'm not foreseeing a ton of use of pesticides in the vicinity. What a difference in price. Like that's astonishing. Yeah, and if you have a Middle Eastern market, you'll find it there. Right. And yes. in, in Canada, I have found it in um, like specialty ethnic markets. So Middle Eastern market, like Carla's referred to. And I can find it pretty reliably online with Amazon. But again, the prices are higher. So if you happen to live in an urban area where you can get to like an ethnic market of one kind or another, I would recommend Fonio because it really does have a great taste. Um, my kids really loved it. And I made it both as a savory something like you could do with rice. So using it as a bed for some kind of stir fry or whatever. But I also made it as kind of a breakfast alternative and put a little bit of maple syrup on it. And I could not keep that stuff in the house. So in terms of, I think, grains which are easy to make use of these two are wonderful and the one that I was thinking about adding and we had talked about as a group but didn't make it to the slide yet was corn so you know the the options in the grains area may be different depending on your personal food sensitivities or if you have other allergies or things like that but um you can certainly look at um a simple white rice, a fonio, and niblet corn, um, all as options if you were looking for the kind of thing where you're using a grain as a base and maybe putting a stir fry or something over top of it. And if you like couscous, fonio is a, is a very good alternative to that. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And you can also try it um, for pancake as a pancake base or crepe base. Mm -hmm. as well so it's very versatile and that's what's really lovely about it okay nice colorful slide lots of options here um, my personal favorite legume is red lentils there's so much you can do with them but that said fresh green peas were a staple for us as we first got going on low oxalate because it was something everybody liked and it was very low in oxalate. So if my kids were just hungry and I ran out of the other stuff in the meal, if there were green peas available, they would eat them all by themselves. So that was one of our big ones. Black eyed peas, chickpeas, uh, and the green and yellow split peas are also all 
low enough in oxalate that you can really just essentially eat these and not worry too much about it. And as you can see, you've got some great color here. So it depends on what you're trying to do, but you can add some color to that plate and make it look more enticing as well. Black eyed peas were a hit here. I mean, we would put them in soups, put them in chilies. I made refried beans with, with black eyed peas. I made brownies with black eyed peas, black eyed pea burgers, you know. Red lentils became another, uh, another favorite, but black eyed peas were definitely uh, a staple a staple here. There's so much that you can do with them. Totally agree. We use them as, in chili and stuff as well. And then once I got that, I understood how easy it was to use black eyed peas all those ways. I was starting to use chickpeas all those ways as well. So I was throwing them in chili. I was, you know, doing different things with them. So there's a lot of versatility here. I think we all agree. Yes. Lentils, you can also use them for bread and for flatbreads and all sorts of lovely things. So it's not only a soup or a, you yeah. know, that you can yeah. use. Them. Nuts and seeds. So here we have the famous baru nut, which is really the only nut that is very, very low oxalate. And I am very sad to say that I have not been able to find them in Europe. But if anybody does, this is an open call to tell me where they got them. So. <laughs> and baru nuts are also called barucas. And, you know, compared to like an ounce of almonds or an ounce of almost any other nuts, an ounce of baru nuts is about two milligrams of oxalate. So it's orders of magnitude difference. So if we can find ways for people to be able to find these things, as Patricia's saying, this is definitely an open call because it's one of the, the only nuts where you can really eat them freely and not have to worry about counting them unless of course you're going to eat several kilos of them that might be a whole new ball game but if all you're doing is having sort of a typical snacky kind of serving here you can even have two three four ounces of them and still be in a range where you're still doing okay so yeah would be wonderful for us to know more here absolutely and the pumpkin seeds are another favorite and we do them ourselves you know because we do use a lot of pumpkins in pies and as a substitute to fries and things like that so we take those little babies and we just put them on the oven a little bit you know roasting sometimes a tiny bit of you know salt a little bit of rosemary or something like that and you have an incredible snack which is fun and it's crunchy and it you know, it fills a lot of those wanting. Yeah, taste something taste and whatever. Mm -hmm. Something you for us. Also grind it. You can grind it into a flour as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've we've thrown it in with the coconut flour and and made pancakes and crepes. It has a little more of a savory flavor. So. But it's versatile enough you could, you know, use it for, for savory dishes as well as, you know, sweet dishes. Yeah. And somebody in the group just made um, pumpkin seed butter in her yep. blender. So there's lots of ideas that we can go through here. Yeah. And those are high in magnesium as well. Mm -hmm. uh, veggies. The the veggies, there, there are more options, obviously, than you'll see on this list. But these, again, are the ones where it's pretty reliably low oxalate so that you're not going to have to think about a day when somebody's extra hungry and you're giving them a bit extra of something. So your, your best options here would be the cabbage family in general, although there's some notable exceptions. But if you think green and white cabbage, um, red or purple cabbage, and we call it by different colors in different parts of the world. So um, that's why we've got green slash white and red slash purple. 
bok choy, cauliflower, kohlrabi. These are all really good options. You can eat the greens from your kohlrabi as well. So it's not just the bulb. And so while something like a curly kale would be too high for anybody to be able to eat freely, these members of the cabbage family are all good choices. Then we have the squash family. So we're back to our, our, our relatives of the melons. And if you think butternut, uh, chayote, which is a very different squash than the others, you can eat the peel. It's only got a single seed in it, but a great lower carb option if you're interested in that. And one that we've started to include in stir fries as a, as a really nice bit of crunch. You can look at your delicata, your spaghetti squash, your acorn squash. All of these would be ones where, again, we're not worrying so much about that serving size and we're able to eat them pretty freely. Um, and last but not least, the lettuce family. I don't think there's a single lettuce that we've tested that has been anything higher than low oxalate. And many of them are very low. And if you hadn't realized you can cook lettuces, you can indeed. I found this great Dutch recipe for green pea and lettuce soup. It was quite good. Um, and if you want another leafy green option, which is not technically a lettuce, but has a very good reputation as being very low, we've got arugula, which is also called rocket. And... This, these can up your game in terms of nutrients, in terms of greens, in terms of the, even this red or purple color, so that you're getting different nutrient profiles even across all of these options. And, and lettuces and cabbage, you can also roast. Lovely with a little, you know, balsamic vinegar and pop that puppy in the oven for a couple of minutes, awesome. Absolutely. And don't think these are the only ones. Remember that you have the spreadsheet and you can actually put in the filter lower, you know, lower or medium or high if you're already, uh, if you're still at the beginning of your journey. And you can get a whole lot of different choices per portion. And that's the other thing that we need to just continue to repeat every single time. The levels that we're putting are not for the food. They're for the food's portion. And the portion size is there listed in the spreadsheet. So um, we're not talking, when, when we list sweet potato, we're not talking about sweet potato. We're talking about a portion, a hundred gram portion of sweet potato, which is a little bit less than half of the sweet potato. And I shouldn't have mentioned sweet potato because that was in our other session when we were talking about the really high items but um as an example just for you to visualize something we please remember that everything that we list on the spreadsheet is not talking about the food it's talking about a portion size of that food yeah very good reminder and we we are suggesting things here where you can eat them pretty freely because per portion size they are very low, but I suppose if you did sit down and eat an entire delicata squash yourself, you might be in trouble. So let's let's um, let's remember that even though we're biasing in a direction, uh, we're not necessarily setting you up for a completely unlimited. But at least this way, if you're eating to hunger, you should be okay with these foods, and it's ultimately about portion size. Absolutely. Uh, Carla, do you want to handle the spices? Oh, yes. This is, this was <laughs> very Im important to me as, as a foodie that there are a number of good low oxalate spice, spice es extract, herb extract alternatives you know you've got chives you've got garlic cilantro if you're a fan of nutmeg nutmeg is is medium oxalate mace is part of that same plant and is very low a, a lot of your herbs are 
or low per teaspoon. You know, thyme, basil. Fresh is, is actually better. You know, from probably from an oxalate standpoint. So, you know, a, a teaspoon of fresh basil is going to end up being like a half teaspoon of the dried portion. So, you know, you can use, you know, smaller amounts of, of the fresh to still get the flavor that you want. For the higher oxalate herbs and spices, look at extracts, you know, spice drops, even some of the herbal extracts, you know, you have, you have curcumin, which is a turmeric extract. Very low, still tastes pretty much the same. Cinnamon extract. For condiments, mayonnaise, mustard, you know, your olive oil and in, in, in vinegar, maple syrup, that they, they are all very low oxalate. You know, honey, not so much, but you can use little amounts of that as well. And actually, while we're talking about condiments, I have a really simple recipe for those who are here and listening. And this is what we use for years for our um, salad dressing. And basically it was equal parts of good quality oil, but good quality olive oil we were using. Um, a, a good quality apple cider vinegar and maple syrup, equal parts of those three. And then we would add to the bottle um, crushed garlic. This was our standard um, salad dressing here for a very, very long time. It is very simple. It's all whole food ingredients. And honestly, if you're using those three, there's almost those three big ingredients, the oil, the apple cider vinegar, and the maple syrup. It's really low in oxalate per how much you would put on your salad. And the other version of that we made was olive oil, balsamic vinegar, and maple syrup with crushed garlic in it. Really, really good. So you do not have to give up flavor and you do not have to give up enjoyment in order to eat a low oxalate diet. It's no different than any other way of eating in the sense that we want to be focused on what works best for us. And I think it's really important to start focusing on what we can eat rather than on we, what we cannot. Yep. So uh, then once you start realizing that you have a basis like this list, and then you start adding some other things from the spreadsheet, of every time you add an ingredient, you're opening that um, rainbow of possibilities. So just, uh, I think it's easier to add than to think this, not, this, not, this, not, this, not, but then start thinking this, yes, this, yes, this, yes, and also this. And this is our beautiful baby in the bathtub. So you have to remember that your reactions to food that you're eating are not necessarily linked to the particular food that you just ate once. So um, if you ever get a reaction and you're biasing and you're doing things and you're seeing a reaction, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Start saying, noting it down and then trying again in another context, another day with other ingredients next to it and, uh, and see how you're doing. So you have a basis that we're giving you now with low oxalate foods, but you have to remember that you have to lower them slowly from the level where you are at at this moment. So this does not mean that you only go trace to low oxalate from a very high or an extremely high diet. And uh, the pattern is more important than precision. So you just want to bias 
your diet towards that lowering curve or you're lowering slowly your level. And um, so you're not losing foods as much as swapping staples. And so this is going to be really, I think you should take it as something really fun. I got my phonio yesterday and I had a super nice evening just cooking it up in all different ways and trying to find out what to do with this thing. So um, make it fun, make it exciting. And if you need any help, you can um, join us via the TLO group, the Trying Low Oxalates group on Facebook, the Trying Low Oxalates group in uh, Groups.io, mm. the Wizards of Ox, the YouTube channel, which is at Wizards of Ox altogether. Uh, Monique Attinger's Patreon group or uh, sending us a message in any of the above. You know, you can have individual help or even, you know, consults for your specific case uh, with uh, one or more of the wizards. So if anybody wants to say anything else. Well, I, I would just, you know, uh, agree. Have Try to have fun with it. I mean, our diet after we started low oxalate expanded so much. Just because I was I was trying for my son's sake to not have him feel like he was being deprived. Mm -hmm. And and I was lucky to have a kid that was as into experimenting as I was, you know, I, I frequently call him my test subject or guinea pig and, and he laughs, but you know, I would be like, you know, Ian, we're going to try, we're going to try collard greens because, you know, that that's a, a fairly low to medium and we could work it into the diet. He was like, Oh, and he was always game for trying something new and you know he'd bring me recipes mom try this can we make this gluten-free dairy-free and low oxalate yeah we'll try and I, I was you know very very lucky and because of him my diet expanded you know i was eating stuff that you know i never thought of eating some of these you know some of these foods and and my diet Culinarily, it was it's pretty robust, but you know he made it even more so. So it doesn't yeah. have to be it, it. It doesn't have to be about deprivation. Yeah, absolutely. So my favorite story is the whole story of how we discovered that you can cook radishes instead of eating them only like raw and whole which is kind of how I'd eaten them as a kid and my kids decided that they did not like radishes and I had planted a whole row of them in our garden and so we had all these radishes and I was like oh my gosh my kids don't like raw red radishes what am I going to do and I actually started to do some research found all the ways that people were using radishes really creative like an alternative to potatoes and potato salad and in stir fries and roasting them and we've started this now 10 plus year love affair with radishes mostly as an accident because I had planted a whole bunch of them in our garden and didn't know what to do with them when my kids didn't want to eat them raw and we've gone from there to figuring out that radish greens are actually low oxalate and that they have some great nutrients in them and we can use those as a steamed green. And so, um, yeah, I think if you can have a little bit of spirit of adventure with this, especially if you're already a foodie, and you may actually discover that your current diet may not have as much variety in it as you think until you start looking at these swaps and you go, well, wait a minute, I had one food I'll use spinach as an example. I had one food I was trying to replace, but now I've got collards and I've got um, 
lacinato kale and I've got radish greens and I've got turnip greens. And you know, like you may have subbed in a bunch of different things just because you were thinking about what do I do if I can't, if I can't do spinach. So there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of fun in learning all this stuff. And I'm also going to argue if you get adept enough at some of it, I've had my mother's elderly friends over to um, and served pizza to um, an elderly woman I call aunt and who is of Dutch extraction. And other than the fact she couldn't pick up the cauliflower crust because it's a little more wobbly than a gluten crust. She was like, this is really good. Can I have your recipe? And so you you might be surprised at what you find out when you when you when you try some of these things, maybe even put them in front of other people. Uh, it's not, it really isn't deprivation. Other people will go, ooh, this is interesting. What's this? <laughs> and the flavor changes in in some foods between raw and cooked. Radishes, you know, Ian's not a real fan of raw radishes because it tends to be a little hot yeah. and it has a little bite to it. Yeah. But you roast it or you saute it and it it becomes very sweet. Mild and sweet. And, That's what totally threw me. <laughs> chayote squash. Apple pie. You know, I'm I'm on keto, so apples are kind of off my menu. Made myself a, a little pie that I'm going to have for Thanksgiving with chayote squash. It tastes like apples. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what you discover as you do a bit more experimenting. I know that Patricia's got some of her stories too. Just have fun. I think uh, if you give yourself a challenge, kind of like, what am I going to do for my kid's birthday? Or what am I going to do for, you know, Thanksgiving? Or what am I fixing for Christmas or whatever? We're going to be talking about those topics pretty soon. But it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And you can really start discovering lots of things. Uh, my story really about trying new things and having the kids love new things are uh, well, I have several that are just kind of like jumping in my head but I have uh, one where I have two tiny toddlers in the supermarket and they see that they have these um, mushrooms and like mom look we have huge mushrooms can we you know can we put them in the oven and you know put some meat on them and whatever and the guy was like, I have no idea what those were at their age, you know, <laughs> and these kids are getting excited about them. Yeah. And uh, and just, you know, having my kids coming and saying, oh, my my friends are asking if you can come and explain to their moms, you know, what you, what, you know, what we have for lunch because they're tired of their, you know, bland cheese sandwiches. <laughs> so, you know. So it's um it can be fun. It can be fun. It can be exciting. You can learn about lots of different things and uh and just try out some new things from the from the spreadsheet. One of the things we did is that we rotate our foods. And we have so like Monday's chicken and Tuesday's beef and Wednesday is this and we have an international day. And that just gave us like a bland slate for the kids and for myself to just start checking out different cuisines. So Colombian stew and, you know, all sorts of different things. And you start seeing how you could change it, how you can adjust it. And you get all these new tastes and new combinations. And I think probably the most, the one I'm most proud of is one that my kid did where she did some noodles with um, scampis. And then she says, I'm missing some color. And she put some watermelon in there. That stuff was delicious. I had never, ever thought of warming up watermelon. Oh my gosh, that thing was tasty. It was really, really good. So just have fun. And I think, you know, just keeping it positive, it's going to be a great experience. And that helps with buy-in. I mean, that's, that was 
one of the biggest challenges for me again how do i how do i make my son feel like he's not deprived that this diet is not a punishment and you know when he sees everybody else eating stuff that he can't have goldfish you know, tell the goldfish story <laughs> so we made you know he, he asked you know can you make gluten-free dairy-free goldfish and the crackers uh, right We're yes the little fish crackers and, and they have those the, who don't you know, know about them yeah and, and you know they look like fish and they have you know big ones and he wanted the little ones and i found goldfish molds and used at the time he was dairy free so we used the dia cheese which was low oxalate and i made him gluten free dairy free goldfish and thank god i didn't have to really make those of the year. too often because those molds were were a serious pain but again you know it it was buy-in i used coconut flour and figured out a way to make him coconut flour Doritos, you know, with the low oxalate, you know, spices. Me, me, you know, nacho cheese spices. And it, we would do, I would do meal planning, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, here's what we're having for the next two weeks. And we would all sit down and, you know, the husband would be, well, I, you know, pick a recipe. Like it would be, uh, I want this, and he would be like, I want this, 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 and this, and we would figure out a way to make everything low to lower medium oxalate. That you know, so everyone could eat something that they liked, and you know, it, it worked. And you know, now all of the kids are, you know, they're making, they're making their own meals and. I don't worry about, you know, is is Ian going to go out and get some Doritos? No, he knows how to make his own. And he knows what low lower oxalate alternatives are, are out there that he can safely have. You know, they all do. Yep. Yep. Same experience we had here. My kids have discovered the joys of red lentil chips. So I think it's I, I, I'm I trying to remember Simple 7 or something like that. There's a couple of brands of red lentil chips that uh, that have been tested through the group. And now my kids eat red lentil chips. And I can't complain about that. If they're going to buy something when they're out and they're willing to walk into a supermarket to get those, I'm happy. Yes, they get the Snap Pea, the Snap Pea crisps. Those are, and, you know, it, it's a, you know, you know, it's like veggie and snack. Okay, whatever works. <laughs> So we really do want to encourage you to consider while all of us might depend on a particular shopping list, uh, you have options. And if you're going to have kind of a baseline shopping list, we've given you some options to have a baseline shopping list and be able to feed your family well, not have to worry too much about the oxalate in these things. And particularly if you are already eating a lower oxalate diet, this may be the way to set up your shopping list so that the staples you're keeping on hand are going to be easy ones and the best ones for you to consume. Absolutely. So I guess we're going to stop the recording now and uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes for those people that joined us live. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you soon for another Wizards of Ox Live.